Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another video with On Point Politics, your number one stop for all things polling and election analysis in the United States. And today we have here one of the most accurate pollsters in the United States from the 2020 presidential election. Mark Mitchell, go ahead and introduce yourself, Mark. Uh, hey, everybody. We're from Rasmussen Reports. We've been in the industry for about 20 years now. We don't just do election horse races. We think that there's more to public opinion and we poll more than anybody else about all the topics that people used to care about. And now the media just wants to tell you what to think. Uh, we're very proud of our track record, but I'm the first to say that the reason you should trust us most is because we're unencumbered by massive left-leaning media organizations and we're independent and basically funded by advertisers and subscribers. So if over time we fail uh, to be accurate, our business disappears. So I'm trying very hard every day not to put narratives out, not to shill for Trump, not to uh, be captive by the left regime, but literally just to do my best to tell you the truth about public opinion. And yeah, of course, Mark, we you know all appreciate that. As you know, I just did a collab with Tom Ellsworth not that long ago from Valuetainment, from his show, The Decision. And he's been kind of really adamant on people kind of telling the truth on polling and whatnot. And we also have the People's Pundit as well. And so there's quite a bit of us this cycle really telling voters what's actually going on and dispelling all these Harris plus six, Harris plus seven leads in the popular vote, her being favored on the economy and other things. And it's not just that it's Harris. It's the fact that objectively speaking, we know that's not going to happen. We know that's not true. And so our job is essentially give everybody the most accurate polling information that we possibly can. And Mark has polled on things that no other pollster has really polled on. He's actually polled on illegal votes and everything in presidential elections. He's even polled people asking them if they're U.S. citizens in a likely voter screen, which sounds counterintuitive, but he's actually found some pretty damning results on those. About like 5% of them said they're not U.S. citizens and they have voted. So just little things like that. He's been really trying to be honest with the polling and trying to really go into the inner workings of things. And this kind of suggests that a lot of the shenanigans in the elections are kind of even baked into the polling because if you found that in a poll i'm sure that other people could find it they just don't bother to poll that question that's what it is there they will not touch it and i can tell you absolutely because of some of the topics that we polled we've probably been blacklisted from mainstream um conservative leaning news organizations not just like literally anybody who gets money from pharmaceutical advertisers in my opinion will not even touch our polls. And that goes for, I think, the two biggest uh, conservative-leaning news media organizations. So that's really sad. But what I can tell you is maybe things are starting to change because just in the last month on those two issues, I actually had people from Capitol Hill reach out to us to learn more about the polling. But here's what I think everybody should take away, uh, take as a you know uh, conclusion from what is going on. With Republicans, if you support Trump and if you intend on voting for Republicans and if you're unsatisfied with the Republican status quo, you should be begging for better thought leadership because on any one of these topics, a little bit of polling really can explain to you the path forward or better policies or what sells well and what doesn't. And I can tell you right now that independents and Republicans and even 40 percent of Democrats we're clamoring for the government to be shut down to get a law to prevent illegal aliens from registering to vote. And of course, what happened? Republicans just rolled over on it because they don't want to win. And if they wanted to win, they would be coming to me and buying polls on all of these topics. So we just do it as a public service and love to have people come and read our stuff and see. But I mean, like on every single one of the topics, like abortion, where 53 percent of people say they're pro uh, choice, only 37% say pro-life, but not even the craziest Joe Biden strong approvers, not even half of them want abortion after three months. So really people don't want late-term abortion, but that is the core of the Democrat platform. The core of the Republican platform is just to lose on that topic, right? That's the type of asymmetry there is. And it's it, it would be so much better if they did more polling, if there were more people out there challenging the tough topics and you know, all the money in the Beltway goes to these fat establishment consulting gigs. It's kind of sad. And let's go ahead and look at those national cross tabs first before we get into the state polls. By the way, guys, Mark actually just did 
state polls in all the battlegrounds and even included Minnesota, Virginia, New Mexico, because he's sensing where we're sensing on this channel that they're going to be more competitive than people expect. It's it's a pretty astonishing thing when you look at the RCP and 530 aggregates and people somewhat tend to ignore the fact that there are six, seven points to the right of where they were back in 2020. And my national average, which reweighs all the party ID properly for the electorate, we actually weigh to the Alice Intel electorate for 2020 and their final poll, and we get Biden plus 5.1. I mean, that would have been better than any other aggregator you could have found out there. And I get vote shares that are pretty accurate. Like I get Biden 50.7 and I get Trump 45.6, like literally the best polling numbers you could have gotten that cycle. And when we test this now, Donald Trump is up in the popular vote by around 2.8%, which is slightly higher than what Mark has in his latest national poll, just somewhat coincidentally ends up being the case, even with the liberal pollsters included. And so, and by the way, guys, Mark is weighing to like a D plus two electorate. So if anything, he's trying to be conservative with the numbers and he may still even be underestimating Donald Trump at the national level. But let's go ahead and move into those cross tabs really quick, because I want you to really break down those for us and see what's really going on at the national level. Yeah, a couple of takeaways. And most, these are starting to just look the same week after week, to be honest with you. The last three weeks were all Trump plus, plus two. The week before that, it was Trump plus one. And then the couple of weeks before that, it was Trump plus five, four, three. So it's like she entered the race. It tightened up to a two-point race. It's pretty much been stuck there. Some of these have oscillated back and forth, but this one's pretty in, in the demographics, but this one's pretty like bog standard and Trump's winning men, seven points. Harris is winning, winning women, three points. It's pretty much flat across all age demos, which is kind of weird, but I, I can believe it. 28% still goes Trump in the black vote. Hispanics are winning, you know, going Trump by seven points. Zero crossover advantage. This is new since everybody got supercharged after Harris entered the race because Republic Trump had a crossover advantage there. Hmm. And independents are going Trump by nine points. And to me, there's a couple takeaways, right? It's like I could be – I could be needing a D plus four, just like we had D plus four is what we had in 2020. We were on average, I think six points two left. So part of that, we took out the slack out with a D plus two because Trump lost by four points nationally. So it should be dead accurate. I think there's a, a case to be made that it is our electorate, but I'm not here to predict what could be. I'm here to report on what should be. And it's a good place to be to have a, a D plus two electorate. And even if we're a point or two to right, that still puts Donald Trump at a national popular vote tie, which is better than he ever had with Hillary Clinton. And also, I do think that there's a case to be made that he'll overperform these because this is um, uh, weighted the recall vote. And I'm only leaving room for 6% of people who were not sure or didn't vote in 2020. With this kind of election, listen, the Democrats had a massive turnout game in 2020. We can uh, conjecture about what some of that was, but others were. The TDS vote absolutely did motivate new people, and it was a surprise to some folks. We could be seeing that now, and it would not show up in the polling because if I don't wait to recall vote, this would be like a Trump plus five right now. So um, I'm doing what I think I need to do in order to be accurate. Otherwise, my poll would be flooded with Trump supporters. And maybe it still will be, right, after right. after this all comes. But then the other takeaway is, according to my numbers, the race hasn't moved basically in about a month and a half. And so that is probably 100% different than what everybody's seeing in the mainstream media. And I, I believe our numbers, because like you said, there's you validated it, but there's other people validating numbers similar to mine. Uh, you know, you had polls by New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN's only Trump minus one, Atlas Intel was Trump plus three. So I think Trafalgar had Trump plus two. So we're, there's all perennially accurate pollsters clustered in a national popular vote win for Trump. And then there's perennially left leaning pollsters clustered at Harris plus five. And so who are you going to believe? Right, exactly. That's the problem. This cycle is there's a huge discrepancy, even more than last cycle. 
I mean, now, before you would have, like, oh, Biden plus 12s, which was already a joke anyway. But then, like, the lower end of that was, like, Biden plus 6, Biden plus 5. So there was, like, a range of where it was going to be. But now we have a range. Some pollsters even put out, like, Harris plus 7 or 8 sometimes. Like, yeah. these no names put out Harris plus 7 or 8. And then you have yours that have Trump plus 2 or 3. And funny enough, all the accurate pollsters, I have a new scorecard that I'll show later in this video that is actually accurate to what it really should be. A lot of people tend to kind of go off that 538 one, which isn't even really a good representation because Nate was being facetious by adding in the primary, you know, elections into that. So essentially, guys, we pretty much are looking at accurate pollsters finding a basically a one to three point race for Donald Trump at the national level. Even Alice Intel was the most accurate in 2020. They even beat you and Rich by like a little bit, a tiny, tiny yeah, bit. We can quibble your, about that. But. <laughs> your, your final average in October 2nd to November 2nd of 2020, that's how I graded it. I did the month average before because Nate and his crossover things ended up having like he included all the polls from the entire year. I mean, he must have because he has you guys as like a three-point miss. But really, the aggregate, the aggregates include about the last month. So it only is fair to grade you guys based on the last month. And your final average was plus four. Emerson averaged out to plus four for Biden as well. Big poll data, you know, the People's Pundits poll, Biden plus 4.1. And then Alice Intel plus 4.7. All those polls either have a tied race, and Rich has stated that it may even be underestimating Donald Trump. He's got a lot of undecideds in his polling. And you have Trump plus two, Alice has Trump plus three, and Emerson, I don't even know if they've done a national poll recently. I don't know. Here's the thing about accuracy, and if you're tracking us, I'd love to make this case to you, but here's our final polling from 2020 right now. And the reason, like it was, I don't know if we were having a methodology puke issue, but Mm -hmm. Final call was Biden plus one, but we had before, the weeks before that we had Biden right. plus three, Biden plus five, Biden plus 12, Biden yep. plus eight, Biden plus one. It was like all over the place. Right. And one of the things it's like, that's great for Alice Intel, but I guarantee you that they were looking at my numbers and they were only also probably pulling monthly. And so one of the things is we're putting out more data than anybody. And thankfully mm -hmm. our, our right. data has been a lot more stable this time around. But one yeah. of the things, and we didn't pull as much state polling last time, is that I also think that a lot of people are getting uh, sandbagged for doing, for being more aggressive with state polling, which is definitely what we're doing this time. Listen, state polls are definitely going to be more inaccurate. And if like two thirds of the polls that you're graded on are going to be state polls, then you're going to have, a, you're definitely going to have a lower accuracy score no matter what than somebody else unless you're Quinnipiac, hopefully people are taking, you know, into consideration the volume of data and stuff like that. But. No, and the state polling, I mean, especially no one's talking about it, but in Arizona and Georgia, back in the 2020 presidential election, they were actually weighing to a proper party electorate sometimes, even sometimes actually overstating the party electorate. And now all their electorates in Arizona and Georgia are either like R plus one, R plus two, or they have Democrat leading samples like that's ridiculous that that they're gonna be wrong like those arizona and georgia aggregates are gonna be more incorrect than they were before because the party sample just are just that different i want to uh just point out a quick on this whole topic uh, you'll find this yeah. is interesting so look at new york times siena right. came out with trump plus five and they have, an accurate, they have a decent party sample they had like r plus six too yeah that's what we're gonna look at so yeah. You're, you're like, look at New York Times, a left-leaning organization. How come they have Trump plus five, but Rasmussen has Trump plus two in Arizona? But if yeah. you look at the cross tabs and go out to oh, – get out of here – and go out to 2020 vote, they have Trump oversampled in the 2020 vote by four points here. So if you take those four points out of this, then they're only so, showing Trump plus one, which is a point – left of us so in reality their data is roughly left of us although it will show up as a trump plus five and whoever grades them and they're doing that because they 
I guess, made a decision not to do recalled vote across the board in any of the swing states this time. And that's fine. But like, like, look at what might happen if we're right. The New York Times is going to get a three point hit here. And right. everybody's like, oh, you know, and, and in reality, the core of the data means something very different. So grading oh. pollsters is really hard. No, yeah. And I mean, really, yeah, that's the thing, too. A lot of the times on the site, you know, my channel, I go into the numbers and I kind of look at the cross tabs and stuff like that. And Nate Silver will tell you, oh, don't listen to the unskewers and the cross tab divers. But sometimes looking at that recall vote is important because if you have a Harris plus five and the recall vote is Biden plus 15 in Michigan, then like what what's the point of the poll for? But I want you we to dive into uh, an Ipsos cross tab last time. No, we did not. I want to see that. Let's look at that. Oh, boy. Sorry, I just got a Jack Russell came and said hi to me. I think you can find something fascinating. Don't look into the cross tabs. I've heard him say that before too. Yeah. Everybody, just, everybody you know. should be looking in the cross tabs. And you don't need a pollster, be a pollster to do it. Where are the cross tabs, by the way? <laughs> oh, they probably I mean, might not be available. It may, it may not uh, even you know what it is? AB, it's ABC Ipsos that is the, uh, the one that he has them. It's so funny that because would be, they're left leaning pollsters. The cross tabs are always harder to find. Yeah, especially morning console. I think it's all. Oh, morning uh, behind console. Paywall. Behind paywall. Yeah, it's behind the paywall. I assume that they, you know, it's funny with my polling in 2020. I assumed for all of their polling that they weighed to D plus five, and all my state aggregates and national aggregates are pretty much within a point or, or two. And I assume that they weighed a D plus five, which means that they're probably weighting pretty bad. Like if that's happening, they're, they're weighing pretty left because if I assume that they're weighing a D plus five everywhere and my aggregates are accurate, that's a really bad sign on their part. That's a bad sign on their. Yeah. Oh, here it. P P oh, got hit by the ad. Where'd that link go? So this is like a Harris plus five poll, right? Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. And then, but if you go into here, uh, and look at favorability by candidate. Here it is. You get some ridiculous results to see. Wait, uh, no, that's not it. They had, oh, I just, sorry. No, you're good. This that's is fun. a great, this is what I want people to, the kind of stuff I want people to see. Kamala Harris favorability, 47% positive. 44% negative, so plus three. Yeah. Donald Trump favorability, 35 <laughs> positive, 58 negative. No. So that's my – so they, they give her a 25-point favorability advantage in a poll that only has her up four or five points. And what's that's, crazy – That's ridiculous too, because that, yeah. that's 2016 favorables. Well, look – right. Even back in 2016, the you know in October, the month that Donald Trump like won, right? Yeah. They had him 31 favorable to 66 unfavorable. Dude, like that. were probably Clinton plus 12 or something like that. Yeah. So, what? Yeah, uh, it's, look at that. Oh, and here's the other thing too. It's like, well, I guess they're. I guess this is somewhat modern, but yeah, I mean that's. That's why you look at cross tabs, folks. And listen, I like Nate Silver's right. You can um, unskew and grade pollsters and probably come out with a model that is more accurate than the polling industry on average. And I'm not saying like don't look at the rest of the polling industry. I'm saying like just compare my data with my past data and then compare somebody else's data with their past data if you're going to look at individual pollsters. Yep. And if you're going to like look at something like Nate Silver, you better trust that person isn't messing around with the numbers behind the scenes because he can, does, and I think, you know, will if he see he has some kind of confirmation bias. Let's go ahead and look at those state cross tabs because I know you have a lot of stuff that you really want to show people with yep. those cross tabs. But these are the top lines and they are looking not great for Harris at all. Yeah, first column was uh, Biden, and we had Biden down five nationally when these were taken. Yep. Um, actually, it might have been down three in the poll that was taken at the same time. So then in the middle of August, and 
client wanted Montana and Ohio. Right. But everything else was a statistical tie. And now we said, all right, we'll do the core six, but then we'll add four that there's not enough good data out there for. And just running down, like Arizona's Trump plus two, it's flat from a month before. I think that's a pretty big finding because people are talking about all the momentum she has. So literally this includes her debate and the DNC and it did nothing in Arizona. And you're like, all right, well, like that's one poll. That's one data point. But like Nevada's only down one. Uh, Pennsylvania's flat. So there, there's not a like lot of movement. But we have no. Georgia plus three down from plus five back with Biden. Michigan flat at Harris plus one within the margin of error. These are all margin of error three points plus or minus. Minnesota, yeah. Harris plus three. Mm, that's and, not, that's uh, fine. That's, yeah. I mean, and again, maybe I'm a little to the right here, but that's at the margin of error for Trump. And that's like a, you know, Rust Belt state. Like there's a case to be made when you see things like those Teamsters come out. Yep. Uh, Nevada. Trump plus one still might be a little low, might come up. New Mexico, I just finished this literally 10 minutes before your show. Uh, I think the only other polling out there is Harris plus 10 right now. But, like, look, I've 700 results. Yeah. That'll and be a plus or minus margin of error four. Right. But and you're I don't being have cross for this yet. What's that? Right. And you're being conservative with the numbers. Like, you're trying to weigh as fairly as you can to both sides which yeah. may or may not be understating Trump, and you're still getting polling that he's doing better across the board. Bingo, Very especially hard. with independence. That's been the theme. Uh, North Carolina, they like to say that that's going to go Harris this time. I disagree. No. I came out with Trump plus three, and I th think my numbers should be believed because I think North Carolina should poll to the right of Georgia at least. Yep. And uh, also, these numbers were taken literally the three days after the Mark Robinson scandal came out. So there's a case. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, so Pennsylvania, again, tie. It's been tie. Probably like the, the sample was not a lot of new first time voters. Um, was a re I, I feel like it was a really left leaning set of independents. So I do think that Trump's probably going to outperform in Pennsylvania, subject to uh, deep inner city precincts. And then right. Virginia, at the margin of error, Paris plus three. It's like Yunkin won the state. In 2021. Um, and there's a lot of rural people in Virginia. And Wisconsin, a point towards Trump. So, tie. So she, had no, she has had no movement except Nevada, where she quote unquote gained a point, but that could just be a sampling error. Like no, she three points margin of error. I'm surprised that these are as flat as they were. Like part of my issue is trying to figure out every day is the new stuff we see just standard distribution polling, or is it representing some new trend? And it's like I don't see anything here, right? It's flat. Right. Now, do you want to jump into those cross tabs for some of the states and just kind of go over like the general findings of what yeah. you have in some of those states? Well, this is why you're not going to see this from other pollsters. They're not going to do a rich issued based thing to try and get at what is driving people. Like they'll do this first question here. What's the biggest issue? And then they'll move on. We have like 40 questions here and we don't have to hit all the topics, but no, like I like to come in from multiple directions. So we have this first question. This is uh this is Pennsylvania. Okay. We could look at Arizona for the border stuff because there's border stuff in here. Okay. But Pennsylvania, twelve hundred likely voters, margin error three points, literally the end of last week and over the weekend. Uh, and the biggest issue is economy as it's always been, but now abortion takes the place of border security in Pennsylvania. That's a that's a first. Mm -hmm. And it's because Democrats now care about abortion more than they care about the economy. So that's what we're dealing with. And again, like this might be what Barris calls a response bias. Democrats do care about different things than Republicans. But this idea, the signal of just in the last month, month and a half of now abortion supplanting everything no. is I'm seeing it across the board in the national numbers, in the state numbers. And Republicans and independents are aligning very strongly on their key issues. So Republicans, it's 73% uh, 
border and economy and independence, it's like 57%. But then yep. when you add this one in, which issue is the most important one? Abortion, illegal, Im- for the for the next president to solve in the next few years, abortion, legal immigration, rising prices, or protecting or protecting our democracy. Yep, and because Jennifer- the candidate who got swapped in is totally protecting democracy, right? Totally democratic, guys. Yeah. <laughs> 67% of Democrats care about abortion and protecting democracy. Yep. But 78% of Republicans and 62% of independents care about illegal immigration and rising prices. And this is in Pennsylvania, not a border state, right? Right. And so here's the matchups. McCormick's tied. He's doing the best out of any oh, of the Republicans. That, guys. It's so funny because everybody on X, oh, McCormick's going to lose. It's an automatic loss a few months ago. And I go, guys, the Senate candidates not only always underperform the polling, especially during presidential years, they also heard the polls at the end. Like they always catch up at the end. Vance was down against Tim Ryan in 2022 and then caught up in the last month very quickly. And we haven't even gotten to that part yet because they always catch up in October. So it's like everybody's trying to say, oh, uh, Tammy Baldwin, automatic win in Wisconsin, which that's not even an automatic win. Even Alyssa Slotkin against Frank Rogers, that's not even an automatic mm-hmm. win in, in Michigan for uh, 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 Slotkin either. Now, is she favored? Probably. And like Tammy Baldwin, uh, that's like a 50-50 race. And McCormick, I would say at this point, may even be the favorite to win the Pennsylvania seat just because my projected margin in the state is actually a pretty big win for Trump. Yeah. I have him winning by four to five points from the modeling we've done. And if he's winning by that much, he is going to carry McCormick with him. And before we move yeah. on, I want to mention something. I can make a, just to say, I can make a reasonable case for Trump plus two just by shifting a few of my weightings, saying, oh, well, there's going to be more rural vote. Oh, there might be more of this demographic or that demographic. Oh, we really should be waiting at R plus one. And I didn't. I could easily make that case, and this would be Trump plus two with McCormick. Yeah. What did you weigh the Pennsylvania poll to? Oh, we're going to get lost, but uh, that's okay. uh, It is tied. It's tied with a very small independent sample. So if independents show up big and they break Trump, like that's it. It's over. Trump wins. Right, guys. And look, look, guys, Rasmussen right now, Mark has a tight electorate in Pennsylvania with a tied result at the top line level. And we all know the electorate in, in Pennsylvania does break Republican now. At, at least it did in 2020. It was slightly Republican favorable to an extent. And independents were a higher share than 14. He's just trying his best, guys, to come up with numbers that he believes is going to be yeah. within the margin of error. That's what he's trying to do here. And he's trying to be honest and accurate with his numbers. And he's still finding a tied race with a tied electorate, meaning that you could make the case that he's very much going to outperform those numbers. Well, not just that, too. I think I'm probably under counting rural here. I have 24 percent. Yeah. might be higher than that. Um, you know, pretty fat Philly suburb sample. It, 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 just across the board. Um, might be more white than that. Who knows, right? Like it, we could get more middle-aged voters, older voters, and that would probably tip it. So again, I'm not trying to like make a case that I'm only hypothesizing on just to show Trump up. I'm saying like based on what I see now, what's the fairest take? And I think that's the fairest take. Right. Um, so that would, yeah, it, that would swing, you know, that gives McCormick and Trump the win. Right. Uh, so I have favorability numbers. We don't really need to look into that so much other than I have Democrat Party and Republican Party. One, This one was kind of crazy to me because I, I, I feel like Republicans do hate the Republican Party and their numbers are lower than Democrats are for the Democrat Party. But it's actually still pretty high up there. I was really surprised because oftentimes in many different ways, Republicans tell us that they hate their leaders. Um, maybe it's just more of an establishment state or I got more of an establishment sample. Uh, but then we got into uh, what I want to get to. These were the incredible ones. Right. Is, are you better off than you were four years ago? Pennsylvania voters, only 38% say yes. Today's children, will they be better off than their parents? Only 21% say yes. Right. That is like really bad for the incumbent party. Really bad. Only yeah. 11% of independents say yes to that. Is America safer than it was four years ago? Only 28% say yes. Only 45% of Democrats. So look at the number of like Democrats yep. that just like nope out of this question. Like 
You, you know what I mean? Like they 15%. Well, I don't know if it's safer. Like, sure you do. Uh, and then this one, you're going to like this. So we've asked this nationally before. Every single time we ask it, China yep. is the number one enemy facing America. But in Pennsylvania and every other swing state I've done cross tabs on so far, the Democrat Party is now the now, biggest enemy America currently faces. Yep. And it's got a quarter of the electorate of the sample you got, which is crazy. That's a really shocking finding. I wouldn't have even expected that. Yeah. Let me freeze pain so we can get in there. Uh, I honestly wouldn't have even expected that. That so Democrats insane. say 30% say Republican Party and 41% of Republicans say the Democrat Party and 29% of independents say the Democrat Party. So this is why, like, I hear I, – I did a rant on War Room right. and I was mad that really nobody – I'll just tell you a quick story. Like I pitched I pitched a set of swing states to somebody that might be able to fund our October set and I gave a price – and they're like for for ten states, and they're like, okay, that's great. That's for each state, so we just multiply by ten. I'm like, no, that's for the whole package. <laughs> so the polling is essentially free. I probably cost one fifth of what Bill Crystal costs for a year to do all the polling that they could want. Huh. And I think the establishment Republicans in D.C. are very much holding their breath because they're hoping Trump loses and they can get back to their gravy train. There's no, there's no putting the, this back together. There's no undoing the fact that now the number one enemy, according to Democrats and Republicans, are Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. If this, it's not, it's not a, a Romney election that we're all just going to move on from. No. Uh, so this is also crazy. Is like you never see any action on anything, right? But right. if given a choice between two candidates – a 100% deportation candidate and a 100% amnesty candidate. They break Pennsylvania like, go to deportation 50 to 33. Yeah, ridiculous. Look at that. Not sure 16%. Yeah, sure. Totally. Well, the yeah. not sure this is all coming from Democrats. Look. Oh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. Look, 80% of Republicans and I will say independents are split on this one. But what independents aren't split on is on the question of illegal immigration. Is the government doing too much or not enough? And independents say not enough, 56% to 9%. Right. Hispanic voters in Arizona go for the deportation candidate 51 to 31. Whoa. Hispanic voters in Arizona say the government's doing too little to stop illegal immigration, 59 to 12. Wow. Hispanic voters trust Trump on the border, 57 to 36. Wow. Independents want deportation, 43 to 28 in Arizona. That's man, people are really underestimating Trump in Arizona. I've been saying it like there's a big, big possibility that Arizona votes to the right of Georgia. Like it's for all these reasons, it really comes down to in my polling, right? If uh, Trump overperforms my polling, it's because polling is hard and the signal of on the issues was overwhelmed by crazy Democrats responding. Yep, and if it's the Democrats do better in my polls. It's because the world is going crazy, to be honest with you. So, right. Well, those are really, really insane numbers out of those cross tabs. Um, let, let me show you one more. Sorry, this one's quick. Yeah, of course. So let's go ahead. This is the it. level of ins I say insanity, and people are like, "Oh, that's not nice." <laughs> this is Pennsylvania again. When considering gender and sexual identity issues, which candidates' values are closer to your own? It's, it's up. It's up. By, wait, what? It's tied? It's tied. However, <laughs> however, do you agree or disagree there are only two genders? 72% agree. Why? Only 54% strongly agree? I thought that would no. I mean, it's like you got to scale all that up by taking out the not shores, right? Uh, so it's like only 10% strongly disagree. You know, a lot of these people are young people, unmarried. But they, they, they don't know. They don't care, right? They probably, you know. Might have been in the, the club in, in the high school, but um, yeah. but like look at Democrats, eighty three percent say Harris has their her values, but fifty five percent of Democrats agree there's only two genders, and only uh, what is that seventy forty only forty four percent of Democrats support trans in the kids. 
Huh. Only 17% strongly. Only 27% of Pennsylvania voters support transing the kids, but 46% of them support Harris's gender values. So, so that's what I, when I say there's a, a level of insanity in this country, when you can look at these issues and just say, no, like winning is more important. When you can look at the issues of like rising prices and then say, no, protecting democracy is more important because you heard Joe Scarborough rant about it. <laughs> yeah, him. Oh my God, man, that guy. <laughs> oh man, he's a he's a he's a funny one. He's a trip yeah. to listen to on his show. There, I I see things like that, and I say like the regime. We know the regime media is tied into the Democrat Party. Like we know from the Podesta emails, blah blah blah. And you know what? I want to comment on this because I actually Patrick but David. You know, they had a podcast today, one of their home team podcasts. And Patrick said this, and I want to hear your opinion on this. He said that the Republicans who have the money to buy out media companies are just as complicit in the Democrats getting control of the media as much as they are. They're equally responsible for that happening. Um, I think that it's a big club and conservatives aren't in it. I think that large corporations have downside risk and are deathly afraid of being exposed to bad press about third rail topics because I deal in third rail topics all day long. And that if any organization plans to be a functioning business and take money from mainstream advertisers, that really who's deciding what goes on to your network or three things, right? Maybe, you know, 64% of Americans think that intel agencies are influencing news media. So maybe, you know, we know that Twitter was a government sock puppet, but right. you know, they get their nasty grams. I can only imagine the nasty emails that got fired off to Nate Cohn when he put that Trump plus one poll out literally like two days after the DNC. I can oh. only imagine. Oh yeah. I think that happens. And then I think the other thing is like who sets what goes into mainstream news is probably a marketing MBA in middle management advisor or something, right? Something like that. And uh, I think that bites everybody, which is why I think independent fragmented news based on integrity, which is what I think everybody in our circle is trying to do, uh, gets us back to a place where there really is no integrity. Like, listen, for you to convince yourself that protecting democracy as a dog whistle for getting rid of Trump is like the number one issue when the border is wide open. Like you don't, in my opinion, this is my opinion. I don't see a lot of like integrity of thought. there, Right. Uh, and I think that's the issue that we have is that there's no integrity. Of thought. Listen, I like, I'll talk with anybody on Twitter and I, you know, anybody can go follow me at Mark underscore underscore Mitchell. I like to be thoughtful and, uh, think about the ramifications of progress and how it affects public opinion and what might, what might happen. And the only troll posts I get are like, Oh, you're Rasmus. And Oh, you're super right. Or, Oh, you're shilling for Trump. It's all logical fallacies. Like, listen, if you have a problem with what I put out, just tell me and I'll have a discussion with you. And they never do. No, of and course. like, but I'm there to that? learn. It's pretty, it's pretty sad. How many people on X and everywhere else really think that you are like people genuinely believe that you were to the right of inaccuracy by multiple points like yeah. they actually believe that even though when you look at your state polling it was actually just as left in 2020 as some of the other pollsters that were out there and your national right. level was one of the more accurate ones when you actually average out all of the polls and their favorite pollsters like marist and quinnipiac and cnn had five six seven point polling misses and a lot of them haven't really changed their methodologies. And everybody likes to talk about TIPP as their favorite actor at Polster, which they were for a while, but they recently just completely switched their polling firm and are now. Yeah, nobody's going to tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. And they're focusing more on different modes now. And they used to have a good live caller system, but now they're getting Harris plus four, Harris plus fives with a bunch of mixed mode online panels. Like it's completely different, but the Democrats will sit there and say, oh, it's still the most accurate poll, even though the methodology is completely yeah, right. different. And you 
haven't really changed a whole lot. You changed your weighting and maybe made minor adjustments. So probably did rich. Alice Intel probably didn't change anything. And Emerson College, I don't really see how they would change their methodology quite a bit. So the, guy, the people that have more accurate numbers from last time in 2016, you guys show Trump up and you guys show issues where even Democrats are not even the majority favorable on some of the issues that Democrats like to pander to their base for. 100%. And and because of that, we're going to get called shills. And really, it just comes down to like the, the biggest problem, in my opinion, facing America is a lack of integrity. And it is something that isn't being instilled in people. And we've lost a lot of like, there's, there's really strong Judeo Christian roots in America, but there's also a very strong Western uh, roots in that, like this idea of like dialogue and learning from somebody that you have opposing viewpoints to and having the integrity of thought to try and learn from something and reach agreement with somebody like literally Plato invented that like 2,500 years ago. And now we've gone to a system of credentials that people like literally will just sling mud or try and poke your credentials. And uh, like, I don't care. Like, show me the track record, period. Because like you said, any one of these people could lose their integrity at any point in time. And uh, I think that's a problem. And it, also, you you know, you mentioned it's like, oh, well, everybody, <laughs> like everybody, all the down ballot Senate races all tend to like tighten up as we get towards election day. Yeah, that's true. Probably there's some gut check. I think Donald Trump would probably benefit from some gut check in the middle of October unless like literally... World War Three starts. Um, but I think some of that might be it's like, well, we're getting close to the election. We better like clean up our data a little bit. <laughs> and so no, that, that's what happens too. That also yeah. happens. But even then, when they do that, they still end up getting it wrong anyway. Yeah, so, that's true. Right. That's pretty but, funny. And but yeah, but that's also, you know, that's something too. He's a really strong closer and he's only down a point in or, or something like that in RCP. He's yeah. a strong closer and he's only down a point. And the closing doesn't even happen until like o October. So imagine if this if this stays stable, like Harris plus one in RCP, and he starts closing her in October, he could be looking at like a two-point lead in the RCP yeah. aggregate. By the time you get there, you already see the signs of it even developing. A bunch of state polls have it tied or Trump leading. Some of the national numbers have gotten closer like as older polls fall out of the aggregate, you're going to see Trump probably take the lead in the RCP average at some point. And if he closes, yeah, I don't know if he will. Huh? I, I, I'm just guessing, but I think the lefties are going to extend to the end. I think the narrative cover of she's doing almost as good as Hillary Clinton is more important to them than being accurate. That's just a guess. And not all of them. It's just my personal opinion. Uh, but in my numbers, the point is, is that Harris hit a ceiling the day after the DNC ended. Look at that. Yep. Look at that. Yep. She's We're the been, only ones putting out a steady stream of data. It has not moved. Yeah. She's been stable at like 46, 47, which funny enough, Mark, you want to know something funny? That's where she's been fluctuating in my national average. She's been fluctuating around 46, 47%. Yeah. I think at one point she was about to get to like 48 and then it fell after because I think Alice Intel came out. And when I reweighed my electorate to their electorate because I found it to be more accurate and improved my 2020 average. And when I added that in and I added in their Trump lead, it, it just completely like they really that that when that happened, Trump gained like a point on net in my average. Um, it timed up when a CBS news poll came out. What? Uh, they actually had a somewhat accurate track record in 2020, which is kind of interesting. Like they had a somewhat decent average and they didn't really have a whole lot of undecided. So it got a lot of weight and it probably actually helped me be more accurate because I had her getting like 45.8%, which may, may have been too low. So when that poll got added, she went up about like a little bit, almost by a yeah. point. So it's now like a two and a half to three point race nationally for Trump, which is literally within the ballpark yeah. of what you're getting. Well, without your stuff and without my stuff, and, and you look at these polls, if not the same more than I do, let's pick and right. choose which ones to just throw out. Listen, Quinnipiac tie, probably right, but I don't think we should trust anything from Quinnipiac, right? So let's no. just skip them. I would make a case for CNN. I actually remember them hitting like a Trump plus eight or Trump plus nine back in March. Um, 
Which is probably think... was. Yeah, right. it was. Nobody else except Bloomberg once. But let's mm -hmm. use them. Harris plus one. Okay, so that's minus one, one poll. Yeah. All right, let's use us. So that's right. a plus one in two polls. Okay. Right. So then New York Times Siena plus one in three polls. Mm -hmm. Atlas Intel. Yeah. So that's plus four in four polls. So Trump plus one. Who else would we use here? None of them. No, we wouldn't use any of those. Those are all ranked C. They're all There's ranked numbers. C, F. You're right there. You're another two. Uh, there's another New York Times. All yeah, the don't other use any more of mine, but like Emerson, I could make a case for. So that's Trump. Yeah, yeah. Trump, you know? Yeah. Um, no, like even, what even what I did, I did a video the other day. I got Quinnipiac. Another pollster, I think it was the Washington Post and somebody else. I got all their polling from today, like now, and I basically applied their demographics to the Cook Political Report swingometer. And Mark, she's getting 270 in the pollsters that overestimated Biden by six, seven, yeah. eight points nationally. She can't yeah, even beat Arizona or Georgia, North Carolina or Nevada in the demographic modeling for those polls. She's losing them by like two to three points each. Yeah. She can't even, she's narrowly beating Trump in those polls when you model out their demographics. And what's interesting is when you do those same polls for 2020, you get like Biden plus like 12 in the popular vote and you get him winning like 400 electoral something college votes. And when you get this shift between that polling and the polling they have now and you apply it to the 2020 results, Trump's winning all the swing states and he's yeah. close in Minnesota, Virginia and in New Hampshire and New Mexico, like he's close in all of those. I mean, yes, Harris did improve from Joe Biden, but it wasn't that she flipped Trump voters. I think a lot of people have this misconception that she somehow flipped 5% of Trump voter voters to her. That's not what happened. She just picked up a lot of people that weren't going to vote. That's essentially what ended up happening. Yeah, I think so. A lot of 18 to 39 year olds got swayed to switch teams yep. because of glitz and glamour. And they look like they're coming back already. Um, and maybe she's gaining other people. I don't know. Doesn't I? I don't really know. There might be a an age offset. Do you remember what Barris's latest was? What national? Oh, they, they had a they had a tie. I believe they had okay. about a tie. Yeah, and so Trafalgar just had like a plus one point five. So call right. it like a Trump between half a point and one point in pollsters that have perennially done objectively non biased work. Right. Right. So you had a tie in Wisconsin. You had Michigan. She was up by one. You had Virginia plus three. North Carolina, Georgia were lean Republican. Arizona was lean Republican. You also had Nevada up. So he's 268. Guys, he's literally there. Minnesota was a D plus three lead. And you had New Mexico as D plus six. So when you finally look at it from Mark's polling, it, this is what it looks like. Trump is at a floor of 268 electoral college votes and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania are toss ups. And again, like we talked about, you could make the case that those are going to lean left. You could make a very valid case that they are and that Michigan poll may even lean left too. And so if you're Kamala Harris and you're looking at this map right now, this is a horrible sign for you. This is a horrible thing. The campaign yeah. should be freaking out that their only possible win is by winning both Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, states where Democrats have ancestrally done well, except Kamala Harris. Here's the problem, and I'm going to talk about this here. Kamala Harris is does not identify with certain demographics in America with their values, and that includes non-college educated voters especially. They really don't identify with her at all. And just to give a little bit of context, guys, she grew up uh, in Canada for the first like 20 something years of her life, moved back here when she wanted to start a career in politics. Uh, she went to Howard University because she thought that would give her some credentials with the African-American community. And she has a Jamaican father 
and an Indian mother and likes to claim that she's African American, but she's not African American. She's a Jamaican Indian American, but people don't understand that there are some cultural differences between those two things. Like even her own father in 2020 called her out and said, why are you saying that all Jamaicans smoke pot? Like what's, what's up with you? Like it, it's very obvious that there are certain groups where she's going to struggle with because she does not identify with Americans. Even Biden, as unpopular as he was, probably still could have identified with some union workers and some non-college and some college educated. But now even like Nord Notre Dame, there was a university poll from them that they had Biden winning that poll by 37 points in 2020. And Trump is up against Kamala Harris by two points. So he gained 30 nine points in a liberal university poll in four years. And if that doesn't tell you that there's something deeply wrong, then I don't know what will. And the Kamala Harris campaign, and Mark, I'm sure you've heard something like this. They think that this is their electoral college path victory based on the behavior of the campaign, because they've been saying Pennsylvania's gone based on their behavior. And a lot of the reporting that Mark Halpern's done, their Pennsylvania internals and Trump's internals look horrible for her. Wisconsin, yeah, they yeah, really yeah. just gave up. Arizona, they kind of actually gave up too. Nevada, they've been freaking out. They copied Trump's policy on no tax on tip because they saw their internals were probably bad. And even Rich in his show yesterday, he said that he's got early polling numbers in Nevada and Trump is up in Clark County and is up in Washoe by eight points in his early polling. He said that may not hold up, but the fact that Trump's even up by those numbers after two days of data is just absolutely remarkable. And if you were to move Clark County to a tight race and Washoe to an eight point victory for Trump, that's a seven point win in Nevada. Like, and now they're saying basically based on the behavior of the campaigns, they're looking at Michigan, Georgia, and North Carolina as their path to the presidency, which demographically would almost be impossible to happen unless you had extremely high African-American turnout, essentially. And that's not looking to be the case. Mm, you never know, but I agree with you. I mean, that's why I think that media pollsters are purposely trying to give them the cover to talk about North Carolina, because that's yeah. like how, would, how you would start before yeah. you... It's literally like, you know, bombing the beachhead before making an invasion, you know, get the ABC episodes to put out like whoever to put out some super positive poll. Um, yeah, you, everybody can check our cross tabs coming out tomorrow, too, on Nevada. I was wondering if I could pull it up quick. But, you know, we, we do have Washoe and Clark County breakdowns in there. I might be able to pull it up quick in the process data. Uh, and I guarantee you what you find is that Democrats will be overperforming what everybody expects could be possible because that's how I've been setting my polls. But uh, yeah, you know, I've heard that from other people too, that Trump's plan isn't really to focus on Pennsylvania and over the next month. And if that's the case, then whatever, I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but whatever they're looking at says that they want it already. Um, I'm just pulling up the weights here. Where do you right. live in state? So I think it's Clark first, then Washoe. Uh, and, and this is what I do all day long because I don't have very good analytics software. So now, two A. I'll edit all this out, don't worry. So this is Clark County, Harris up oh. uh, four. She's only up four. That's already not wow. good. He loses her the state anyway. Washoe, same thing. Harris up five, six. Oh, Harris that's six. not going to happen either because Biden won it by four and a half. So there's an up and down between these two counties, basically. And then the right. rural vote is going to, the elsewhere in state is going to be right. Trump 58 to 36. Right. And which, what was you know, might be different. What was your electorate in Nevada? Was it like, do you have it yeah, off the top? One sec. Let me look at also this too. <laughs> this is urban, suburban, rural. So pretty tight. Small city goes Harris. And that's a lot of the people. Goes Harris by like seven, 16 points. Mm -hmm. But they're actually tied in 
uh, urban, which would be like Vegas. Yeah, and Donald Trump and Donald Trump in 2020 improved in urban areas here and there. So yeah. that would even make sense too. And then the rural vote is five. That's only going Trump by 11 points. So there's maybe the Trump sandbag. And it's like, listen, it's not the biggest part of this poll. You, there's just, you, you can't nail every demographic. Now, you wanted to know party ID? Uh, I'll tell you in a second. I think it's non controversial. What are you expecting to see? Like, probably plus two, maybe? Uh, R plus one, R plus point five, R, R plus point seven. Okay, so it's probably gonna, it's like a slight underestimation. With so it, independence right. at twenty seven percent. Okay, no, that's that's a fair weight. You have polls in Nevada now that have it at like D plus two, D plus three, the electorate. Like seriously, like it's that's it's not going to be D plus two, D plus three electorate. It's just not. So uh, here's here's the. Here's oh, the thing. The, uh, oh he, he Trump's up in the recall vote for 2020. No, no, yeah. No. Is he? Oh, he's not. Biden's up. Oh no, I, he's up 1.4 points in recall. Trump Trump is up. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's oh, fine. You know I might have I think I threw a data point out after waiting. That's probably why that happened. Ah. Well, that's fine because a lot of the polls in Nevada always have like a recall vote for Trump, regardless. Um, uh, one of the things that I've been looking at, and I might have to do, so let me just, this is a, an interesting take I was checking out. So let me just turn these uh, independents into one number here, is the ideology of independence. Hmm. Uh, okay. So this is where I found a problem, is that my ideology among independents kept being like crazy left in a way that wasn't holding up just two months ago. And it has oh. to be I think it's a function of the panels and other people are having problems with it is my guess. So the independents so, have gotten severely left compared to what they so were before Biden dropped out. This is Democrats, this top right. one. So four and five would be liberal. Okay. And I can tell you right now, this is a pretty high number of liberals for Democrats because usually they like to call themselves moderates. So 37% moderate, 48% liberal, and only 35% of Nevada Republicans call themselves very conservative. And normally what you see a lot more Republicans call themselves conservative, but it's only 68% here. So that tells me also something about my Republican sample, I think. And then you got 26% of Republicans are moderate. Ugh. I don't know in this environment. Like, it, it, again, these are the kind of things where I'm looking like, and when I feel like I'm too conservative, meaning not conservative, it's things right. like this. And then I see independents, and the independents say 56% moderate. And mm -hmm. everybody's like, oh, they're independents. They should be moderate. Well, it's no, like, no, nationally and across the board, they're being conservative. And no, here, only 26% of them are conservative. So I guarantee you that this is why that particular cycle. And it's like, you can't wait this out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so it is what it is. But moderate is code speak for liberal in today's um, political environment. And so I get a massive liberal sample here for independence. And I bet you the party breakdown is probably... Uh, That's very high for it. I bet you I have liberals... I, I bet you I have independence going... Harris by a few points because of that. And and it's like, okay, we're really getting into the weeds. But if you guys want to know what's going to decide the election and who's right in the polls, it is, in my opinion, literally this thing here that we're looking at. So Democrats go 92% Harris. Republicans go 91% Trump. No. That, I know. But I've had a Republican crossover advantage, again, in all of my polling up until August. And so I think stuff's ha happening in the panels. And here, right. independents only go Trump by two points in Nevada, even though independents just went nine points nationally. So those people in the national polls that say they're going for Trump by nine points among independents, they live somewhere. In right. fact, they live everywhere in America. 
which on average would be like a battleground state, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like not all of a sudden all of the independents in Florida went way brighter than the independents in California went left. Like it did, I, I don't think it works that way. So no, anyways, not. sorry for the wonky details, but that's what everybody signed up for. No, of course. But this is important to look at because, yeah, that is a very interesting thing because that is what's probably causing the response bias. And you even seen it in other polls where – it's like Harris plus like it's like Harris plus 98, 99 with Democrats and Trump's winning Republicans by 88, not 89. There's no way she's going to have a 10 point advantage in the crossover. Like that's just not going to happen. So here's why Nate Cohn and the New York Times and other people are ignoring recalled vote. And I don't necessarily think that's the right thing to do. I think party. And again, I've been pay, I've been placing less emphasis on party weightings. I I think the recall vote one is more important. I mean, I'm still waiting by them, but I think people define themselves a lot differently now that Trump has taken over the Republican Party and independents brought Trump to the most votes he ever, any Republican ever got. I think that's changed the landscape. And what I've tested multiple times and seen every time, forget the party crossover vote. Just forget. Like they always show almost exactly, quite frankly, a lot of the pollsters will give the Democrats an edge there. But every time I've tested 2020 voters, mm -hmm. Trump gets more of the Biden voters than Harris gets of the Trump 2020 voters every single time. And it's always two, three, four percent. And then Trump's going to pick up a whole bunch of the didn't vote folks or the new voters. So, And that's what's going to that's what's going to give him. A lot of people are like, oh, how can he be up by two or three points in the popular vote? There's no way it's the new voters. Those new low propensity yeah. voters are really breaking trump even the gen z vote the past two years is like heavily skewed republican like yeah. even compared to the midterms it's pretty bad for them yep yeah you talked about education and values people with no diplomas on gender identity think that harris matches their values everybody with no college degrees say trump does this is pennsylvania and then everybody with a college degree is like tied or leans harris that's not even good enough for her. That's yeah. those are bad numbers with college yeah. grads. Those are bad. Single, but yeah, still, yeah. I mean, those are horrible numbers, especially with do graduate degrees are more right than college. Oh man, that's really bad. Yeah, this is fascinating. Maybe it's that's, like that's all, of, all these folks that went to school in Pittsburgh. I don't know. That's really bad for Harris. She's doing worse with grads than college grads like graduate degrees in college that's that's a bad sign you can check georgia so this is georgia um oh and this is interesting because they have a lot of universities over there like um georgia tech and stuff like that so trump's leading on the high school some college and college trump is leading by he two loses with everybody but graduate he wins with everybody but graduate degrees in high school no Everybody, wow. yeah, in high school dropouts. Right, right. And no. they're relying on like federal programs and we're not. That's not really surprising. No. That's why they're breaking that way. But he's, guys, him being up in Georgia with college graduates is bad because there is a lot of Atlanta oh. universities that are very liberal. I mean, there's an Atlanta. Oh, no, no. This isn't the matchup. This is the matchup on gender values. So the matchup for uh, Georgia – Gender values, okay. The matchup for Georgia by education – Right. It's only oh, a three. Yeah, it's, almost, it's almost identical. It's, <laughs> of course it is. Actually, right? he's leading with no diploma. He's even leading with no yeah, diploma. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And he's with college, huge... he's only up by three. And there was a, a yeah, school nine. there that just passed a, a rule there that they can allow – uh, the same two two different genders in the same dormitory that are supposed to be, um, you know, only certain types of dormitories. Like it's supposed to be only male, only female in some rooms, and they're letting transgenders into those rooms now. So the fact Even that that in Georgia and you're seeing Harris only leading by three with college graduates is a really bad sign. Even though 71% of graduate degree holders in Georgia – Agree that there are only two genders. Yep. Look at that. And even college grads. Look at that. Yep. That's Same crazy. Yeah, funny enough. Yeah, that's funny. And it's kind of funny that the graduate degree 
is the demographic that agrees with that statement the least. They should be the most educated demographic. <laughs> <laughs> the more educated you get in college, the more likely you're to think that there's you're just you're it's just for YouTube warning, aren't you? And they're most supportive of trans and the kids, except for high school. When the, these could be small subsamples, I don't know. But look, no diploma, like you said. The values of people dependent on the state align with the values of the state, right? So to close this out, we're going to be going over a couple things that people have been talking about on X and some things about 2024. Um, as we all know, you know, Donald Trump is the Republican nominee. It's obviously a given. But, you know, there's people out there that will say, oh, you know, actually DeSantis and Haley could have done better in the general election. And my position on that is that DeSantis probably would be losing the popular vote by like four to six points right now. And Haley would probably be down double digits in the popular vote. Kennedy probably would have stayed in the race and probably would have gotten like 15 to 20 percent. He probably could have even picked off Maine at large and New Hampshire and a couple of other places with like a high independent vote share. I want to hear your opinions on that, because I think you would have some pretty interesting positions on that. We've asked the most important question to understand this is we asked is the Republican Party, the party of MAGA and Donald Trump. And time and time again, a strong majority of Republicans, roughly 75 to 80 percent, have agreed with that statement. And that's just fact. And if you look at Donald Trump's Republican favorability rating, are they super high? No, they're not perfect, but they're higher than any other Republican we test. And there was only like one time in the recent polling history I can even think of when another Republican came close. And that was when DeSantis, there was a lot of will he, won't he's back in like November of 2022. And he got up to where Trump was, which is like roughly 75% positive favorability in Republicans and north of a 50% very favorable rating. You know, fast forward to like March and April, forget what month it was, we tested DeSantis again. He had just gotten a 58% Republican very favorable rating, just actually passed Donald Trump. The only time I've seen it in recent polling history, the very next time we tested it was 38%. All he did was declare his candidacy. So in my opinion, all the Republicans are very heavily invested in Donald Trump, and they've gotten the world's worst lesson in backstabbing, and I think they're craving loyalty, and that's not what DeSantis did, right? No. That's the that was the problem. Yeah, if DeSantis wouldn't have ran, he probably would be the GOP frontrunner. He probably would have been a, the VP. Probably, he probably would have been the nominee yeah. for the vice presidential slot. More than likely, no, would have set him up for twenty twenty eight. I don't know if this stink will wear off between now and twenty twenty eight. What I can tell you is that, like Romney, after he impeached Donald Trump, his numbers oh. absolutely tanked. He no, polls okay. like Nancy Pelosi does among Republicans. Guess what? He's still there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, like, it didn't yeah. come back. Um, but Nikki Haley, hard. then you're, you'll see people on that. So we got to go back to the days of Romney and, 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 so, and uh, Paul Ryan. Yeah. You want to lose uh, 500 electoral votes? <laughs> like, I mean, with those numbers, what was he polling? I'm sure he was polling in like in the 30s, 40s with the Republicans. Is that what it Romney, was? Romney, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to guess here. Like 8% very favorable among Republicans, maybe another 20% somewhat. Oh, like, that is worse than I expected. Wow. That yeah, crazy. that's like kind of where Mitch McConnell is. I think he he was like 7 and 23. He Mitch McConnell polls among Republicans like Nancy Pelosi does, basically. Wow. Um, really bad numbers for Romney. That's terrible. Wow. Those are horrible numbers. Jeez, yeah. yeah even we, Paula Harris would smoke Romney in a general election now. Like, Harris would probably even win Florida, <laughs> to be honest. Like, she would actually have a real shot at winning Florida at that point. Like, that's how bad it is. And unlike, you know, now Alan Lickman's son uh, has Harris winning Florida now in his latest election map forecast, which is pretty hilarious. If but, you run as an anti-Trump Republican, I can tell you what happens to your numbers. And Nikki Haley in June of 2024, was she still – she was still holding on by then, right? Or no, is it over already? No, it was over. It was done. Yeah, it was over. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was um this was in the Nikki Haley should be Trump's VP poll that we put out. Oh, it was probably bad, right? Like it was like oh no by like a huge margin, right? Republican numbers, ten percent very favorable, but thirty six percent somewhat favorable. I will say that. So she almost got to fifty percent. She got to forty six percent among Republicans. But that's but not even fascinating. 
She got to 31% among Democrats, though. Uh, but you see, that's a bit, that's even a bad number because usually the numbers for the VP pick should be 80, 90% favorable. So even having a 50, 50 split is pretty bad. That's bad for being a VP. Oh, this is, this is hatred. This is seething hatred yeah. practically. You know what I mean? Like, Those are uh, you know, maybe not nearly as much as, uh, Pence, Romney or McConnell, no, but, but McCarthy certainly outpolled this by at least 10 points for sure. What? Yeah. Oh man! Wow. Even McCarthy outpulled it. Wow, that is embarrassing. Those are bad. yeah. I think he got up to like a fifty-five or a fifty-eight. It's funny because yeah. like people will say, "Oh, Haley would be running away with this race against Kamala Harris," and I go, "Guys, she lost a primary in Nevada to nobody." Like what? Like she lost a primary to no one. No, none of these candidates won 70 percent of the vote. And she got like 20, 30. You think she would be running away with this race? That's not yeah. that's not how it works. It's not true. And I don't know. I just I, I just kind of wanted to hear your opinions on those things. And like Ian DeSantis, like Rich has said okay. something. Rich, Rich has said that like DeSantis would probably be polling within five in Ohio. Uh, I think that could actually be true to an extent because I don't think he'd do as well with non-college because – he, that whole base would be gone. Now, I think DeSantis may perform slightly better with college grads, but non-college is way higher of a vote share than the college graduates are, unlike what most people believe for some whatever reason liberals think that like half of the electorate, half of the white electorate is non-college and the other half's college, but it's really not. It's like a 65-35 split, actually. Um, I think DeSantis probably would do slightly better with African Americans, maybe, than Trump 2020, but not even that much. And his Hispanic numbers, I don't think would be great either. He'd probably actually improve the most with Asians. I think that's true. Uh, that's an inclination that I have. But overall, he'd lose enough with non college to really not be the overwhelming favorite. Like, he definitely wouldn't be ahead by two or well, three right now. He'd probably be. We tested him. this too. So, this is January of this year. Mm -hmm. And in a poll that showed that Trump would beat Biden by eight points nationally, yep. DeSantis beats Biden 42 to 41. Oh, wow. That is really – that split's really bad. Yeah. I mean, it's a win in electoral Biden college. Biden versus uh, – Biden. this one's hilarious. Biden versus Haley. What is it? <laughs> I can't even get it out. It's so hilarious. <laughs> Biden 38. Haley 36. And you're like, well, how is it both in the 30s? It's because 21% oh. of national likely voters it's going to pick some other candidate. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So Kennedy I, Republicans. Between I, I, a selection of Biden and Haley, a Republican, 24% of Republicans said they wanted another candidate, and only 55% of them would vote for her. <laughs> oh man. And it's like you know ah. exactly what was going to happen if they had succeeded in assassinating Trump. You oh, know, no, it would be front runner away. would have been Haley at, at the convention. It would have been her. They would have been pushing so oh, no, hard. Yeah, it her, and if she would have gotten it, Biden would have not dropped out, and he would yeah. be running away with this thing right now. He'd be running away with it right now. And Kennedy, I argue – if he would have had a national debate with Nikki Haley and Joe Biden, I actually think RFK could have probably gotten pretty close. Like he could have shaken shake up the race. I think if that would have happened, things would have maybe not changed drastically, but Kennedy would have at least won five states, in my yeah. opinion. It would have gotten ugly. I mean, and, and that sounds crazy, but there was polling that came out that had Kennedy in second place with Nikki Haley in the poll with Biden, like some liberal pollsters even had that. So it's yeah, like, wow. what I'm saying is completely possible. That yeah, would have no, been. Kennedy got up to 16% in our numbers. There was like a window where uh, public opinion could have rapidly shifted. I think the problem is he never really had any of the fundamental structure behind him and just incompatible with the Democrat values and Republicans have a candidate they want. That's what it comes down to. If Republicans right. had a candidate they didn't want, then you know, that, that she yeah. he might have picked up thirty percent of the Republican vote here from her, maybe even forty. Right. So, all right, guys, that is the collaboration discussion today with Rasmussen Reports. Thank you, Mark, for being on again. I know we had a long show, but we had a long discussion about you know polling and certain questions that 
you know, pollsters won't touch on, which I think are important to look at because it's nice to look at those little nuances. And a lot of times you get samples that are sampled very heavily one way and you'll see, oh, gender transition, 80 percent favorable among Democrats. And everyone knows that's not true. And so it's nice to see, you know, honest, accurate numbers. And also, too, it's like everybody needs to stop with this thing that Rasmussen's always to the right by multiple points. That's factually incorrect. And they yeah. actually, there actually is nothing. There's, there's nothing. There's that, that doesn't exist in 2020. There are no far right pollsters. Like that's literally not a thing. It's true. All the far right pollsters were within half a point of getting the popular vote correct. And the left wing ones were like seven, eight points off. There is no pollster in 2020 that, missed to the right of the popular vote by over a point in their averages. No one had it. I don't Not think even... there are any in 2024 either. I think uh, no, no, they're going to learn their lesson for sure. No, of course. And I don't think that's going to be the case either. But uh, go ahead and give any uh, closing comments that you may have. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have everybody as followers. Um, we get into it pretty deep on Twitter, Mark underscore R underscore Mitchell. Rasmussen polls the big account. That's where you can follow all our stuff. Um, just to tease some of the things I've done recently. And again, we have stuff that you'll never see anywhere else. Uh, did a video with Brianna Morello today. It's going to be a really great show. We actually ran the numbers to see who uh, <laughs> unmarried female cat owners are going to vote for. And it's uh, not not exactly what you'd expect. But uh, that's what you get when we poll more than anybody else. You get more data than anybody else. Right. All right, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. You have a good one. Yeah, you too.